Welcome to uh, How to Grow Your Support to Become a Cornerstone of the Business. I hope everybody's having a good DrupalCon. We are with Kalamuna. Uh, some of you may know us. We have the big balloon out there in the convention thing. Uh, we're the makers of like Calabox, Calisthenics, Calatheme, Cala everything. Uh, we're a bunch of rabble rousers. We're a diversified team mostly. I live in Southwest Florida. We have an office in Oakland, California. Uh, we're all over the place, all over the globe actually. My name is John Willette. I'm the senior developer and support manager, and my main job is to de-jank the jankiness in your janky websites. Uh, I've been doing this for 22 years, um, and here's my Padawan, Katie. Um, I'm a junior developer with Kalamuna. I've been working with them almost two years now, and I work out of our Oakland office. And I got uh, put on support very quickly into my tenure at Kalamuna and John Ouellette has been a great manager and a senior developer there. So, you know, the whole point of this, you know, why are we going to do support for clients? You know, and, this, and it all falls back to about four years ago when I started with Kalamuna. We were like a four-man agency. They hired me because I had sales experience. And, um, you know, our initial thrust was just to be an agency, to do project-based work. And, and at the time, you no, know, everybody wanted to convert their Drupal 6 sites to Drupal 7. And as we're out there banging doors down, we're like, yeah, you must convert your Drupal 6 site to Drupal 7. And people are like, that's fantastic, but we don't have $50,000, you know? They're like, why can't you just help us? Why can't you just help us support the site? And we said, sure, why not? And that's how our support programming program kind of came to be. Um, and in that time, over the years, I mean, we have found that, you know, most sites aren't built very well. Um, they're architecturally a hot mess on the back, back end. You know, it seems like eight different people decided they wanted all the things. And what that leads up to is like the usual end user that we're building the site for can't use their site. They just don't know how. Um, and that's fine. I mean, and then they hire people like us that where we come in and we fix a lot of these things. Um, and usually a lot of our typical support clients just don't have a budget to have an internal dev team. It's cheaper for them to spend thirty to fifty thousand dollars to hire experts instead of paying seventy to hundred grand for an internal dev team. So, you know, when doing this, we've also developed like what what type of person can do support? Not everybody can do support. It's a, it's a, we're a special breed of people. Um, Multitasking is huge. If you can be on Slack, your email, Entertainment Weekly, and answer emails at the same time while writing code, you're made for support. Um, you know, you have to be self-taught, autodidactic, and confident. You know, you can't be like, oh my God, why is this client asking this? You know, you just do it. You got to have a good, you know, good energy about them. You know, yourself. Um, you know, and it, 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 unfortunately a lot of people can't do that and that's fine, you know, not everybody can do all the things. You know, and another great thing, as Katie had mentioned, is that it's great for junior devs. And I'll let her talk. So my experience with support, I think, was a really important part of building up my skills as a Drupal developer. Because working support, you get an experience with like a huge variety of sites. Instead of just working on one or two projects for you know months at a time, you're getting into the weeds with a bunch of different sites, learning about different uh, Drupal distributions, different modules, encountering things like new things every day, um, depending on what you're being asked to do. So it's a it's a really good opportunity to just very quickly explore what's out there in Drupal if you're new to Drupal or a new developer. The other thing about support is, you know, sometimes clients ask for really like specific esoteric things, but a lot of times what they're asking for are just kind of basic things, updating modules, patching modules, you know, things like that, that you can really quickly build up your skills in those basics working support. And it's also really good for those kind of, I guess, we, we sometimes call them soft skills, but the kind of stuff that's not just sitting there writing code or sitting there installing modules. Um, things like interacting with clients, learning how to ask for clarification when you need it, um, learning how to estimate your time. That, for me at least, was a huge thing when I began support. Clients would ask me, how long do you think this is going to take? They would submit a ticket and they would want to know, like, basically how much are they spending on getting this fixed? Is it really going to be worth it for them? And so I had to learn 
how to look at a task and think to myself, okay, how long is this going to take me? Like, do, I'm gonna need to do this research. Um, I'm gonna need to do this and learn how to do that. And with support, you're having to do that a lot. So you build up that skill very quickly as well. And finally, it is also, um, support makes a great sort of playground for training and for doing sort of code review with a senior developer. Um, I mean, first of all, you're working usually in the front end and the back end when you're doing support because your client might ask for you know, anything, maybe they need a little CSS fix here or maybe they need you to fix their permissions over there and you have to be ready to jump into either of those um, pools. <laughs> and so we've sort of developed a program of training where basically, you know, you get asked to do a support task and as a junior dev and you take a crack at it. If you get stuck, then you would go to your senior developer and since all of these tasks are fairly uh, you know, contained and self-directed, it's very easy to be like, look, I have this issue. Um, I'm not really, you know, I got this far with it. I'm not really sure what's going on here and get that um, you know, senior developer to, to help you out there. And lastly, I also find that working support I really like it because even early on as a junior developer, before I had a, a lot of the big skills that you need, it was easy to feel like I was actually contributing to the team and that I was actually helping our clients because, you know, they would submit tickets every once in a while that's like, I can do this. I know how to do that. Yes, fix this view. Got it. Um, and just feeling like you're a valuable member of the team is super important as a junior developer and as someone who is still building up those skills. Hmm? Go back. Um, <laughs> a couple other things too. I mean, mentorship is, is huge. Um, as senior developers, if we're not mentoring the, the next class, then you're doing it wrong. Um, you know, with Katie also too, is like every Friday we have a training session, we do code review. There's a lot of like ins and outs that we've developed over the past four years so that we can create the new class of developers and that they're actually getting the right tools and they're being taught correctly. Um, and it's great that I see that the Drupal org has a mentorship program too. Um, and, and if you have the skill set, I, I recommend getting involved. All right, so let's talk about some fun stuff. All right, so. How did a developer um, like myself become like involved with sales? Well, about 15 years ago, the market crashed, 9-11 happened, all these weird things like kind of happened and I got laid off. I was, I'm originally from New Hampshire and I was working out of Cambridge, Mass. And uh, the whole area just died, it just died. And I swallowed my pride because I had a young daughter and a mortgage and I became a healthcare headhunter. And, and I hated myself every day. You know, I went to work and I was like, but, you know, I had, a, I had bills to pay. But in there, when I walked in, um, you know, everybody was like sitting around Monster and Career Builder. LinkedIn didn't exist yet. And they were just like waiting for like people like us to post their resumes. And everybody would contact them at once. And I was like, this is not the way, man. And uh, I saw the old timers like sitting off to the side, didn't make any calls, and they billed higher than everybody else. So I'm like, I'm gonna learn from those dudes. So I went over and I talked to them and they told me about cold calling and how to do stuff like that. And I was like, eh, I'm, not, I'm kind of an introvert and I don't really want to talk to people. Um, but so I'm gonna find a different way. And I combined technology and my ability to write scripts to scrape the internet and find things and stuff. And I became the best biller in the office until I could get a job back as an engineer again. <laughs> and everybody hated me and it was awesome. <laughs> so when I came to Kalamuna four years ago, um, They hired me to do sales and basically, um, you know, I saw the same thing. I saw that Drupal was easily identifiable. I had been working with Drupal a couple years prior to that, but I mean, when I went, I was kind of like do it all, WordPress, Joomla, all that stuff, typical agency uh, type things. And so since Kalamuna was Drupal focused, you know, I was like, all right, let's figure this out. And I stared at, the, at like the CMS and saw that, you know, Drupal has certain meta tags or body tags. And I wrote this giant program and uh, basically to scrape the internet and find Drupal websites. You know, there's a lot more to it, but I'm not gonna get into it. But with that, you know, we send out about 2,000 emails a month to 
people we've never talked to before. We have a, a vetting process where we, you know, look at every site. We have a lead generator that uses Salesforce to find the right people to talk to. Um, but it's all there, you know. And the main thing about this, and the reason why you do it, is you're not in competition with everybody else. And that's the biggest thing about sales in general is you don't want to battle on an RFP. That's not fun. I mean, you do it sometimes because you know that's just the way this industry works. But you know, and you'll see in the numbers here that a lot of our business comes from cold calling. Um, and it's, I mean, it's really emailing now. I, I don't pound the phones. I mean, that just the, people would get annoyed if you actually did that. But, I mean, so once you do that, once you find out how to do that, um, you know, your revenue source will explode. Um, you know, I'm not going to give you, like, distinct lessons on sales, but I will tell you this. When you send, it, when you send out a cold email to a prospective, you know, lead, don't be like, we work with this company and that company, and we're the greatest, and you should work with us, because they don't give a shit, all right? That what they want is they want, you know, you want to have like an open-ended conversation to kind of like be like, all right, yo, what's up? You know, we, we do Drupal. Uh, we, we see you have a Drupal website. Um, let's talk. And like an informal type of thing. And you'd be surprised. I mean, when you take that kind of approach, more people will respond than like we work with Pfizer and Verizon and blah, blah, blah. And everybody seems to work with them with all the emails I get too. So... Um, and it's funny though, I get the emails from like other agencies and I respond, what is a Drupal, you know, so. <laughs> but, um, you know, we use different tools. Um, obviously, I, I've mes mentioned Salesforce um, and things like that. We also use a tool called SendBloom. Um, another thing is too, uh, things like MailChimp, Constant Contact, a lot of people block them. Um, so you don't want to use tools like that. Use a tool that natively sends your emails out, like SendBloom is a very good one. Um, that's what we use. And then that way it looks more real. Like if you have that, like that when you send the email, and you all know it if you use like SendGrid when you're using a Drupal website, when it comes by that, you don't want that. You want to make it seem like you're actually emailing them. All right. So with all that said and done, this is our total client base um, for support only. So as you can see, almost 40% of our clients come from our cold calling source on the support side alone. Um, you know, a lot of people know us um, since they, the main company is in the Bay Area, so we do get a lot of referrals and word of mouth things and stuff like that. And um, as you kind of grow up with this community, people like swap business, and that's cool. It was very weird for me at first growing up in the Boston area where like every company was your enemy and you must destroy them. And it's, 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 it, but once you actually kind of get into the gist of it, it's pretty cool. All right. As a total company, um, we bring about a, qu a little over a quarter with our Cala lead program of all the business of Calamuna. So who do you want to, you know, who do you want to go after? And this is always a tricky question. Um, you know, we as Calamuna are like kind of a big in the university space. You may know Andrew Malice, who's kind of big in that, that whole thing. And we focus on nonprofits and some tech companies and things like that. So. We've found, after doing this after all these years, that those are the best people to go after because they have budget, they have you know, the money to spend, um, and it, it just, it's just a good type of working relationship. I mean, you want those people who have enough money but don't have enough money to hire a, a, like a dev or two. And, it, um, and you can get the bigger clients. I'm not saying don't, but if you want to have you know, a nice cash flow where like 40% of your income doesn't come from one client, don't ever do that. Um, but you know, that way you have multiple clients with the multiple revenue streams, and that's what you want to aim for. So this is about, this is like a loose terms, but, and also too, you want people who want to adhere to your process. You don't want to be like, my boss wants it now, 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 now. I don't care about your boss, all right? Um, you know, so, you know, we're providing them a professional service. You don't go to a lawyer and be like, give me this, give me that, give me that. They'll tell you to pound sand, you know. Um, and also, too, one of the main thing is, and you'll see some future numbers here, that they always have an open project space. Like, you want a support to go into a project space. You want them to give you hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's the end goal of all of this. All right, like I mentioned before, who you should not focus on. I mean, we're, we're kind of like a unique organization. Um, we don't want people that don't, you know, jive with, with us. Like, we're not going to work with certain clients, and I'm not going to name names because that's not cool, but, you know, it's just like, you don't, 
you don't want that brand associated with your brand, and that's what it comes down to. Just don't get business for the sake of business. That's, you know, and that's general in any industry you work in. They're too big to fail. Um, you know, if you work with a company that gives you like 20 million a year in billing, but they could give, you know, two craps about you, you don't really want to work with that because you're, you're going to like fall into their processes and you lose your identity and you don't, you know, it's not fun. It's not fun, man, because I've worked with it, you know, and it's just, it's not a, it's not a good, good feeling. And again, I mentioned before, for people who don't value your professional opinion. I mean, we, you know, as, you know, especially as you get doing this for a while, I mean, I'm very good at what I do. And I, I'll, you know, people can see that. And if they don't value like what you have to say, why work with them? You know. And another thing, uh, the, my least favorite client is, hey man, we need this done to our website. How much is going to cost? Uh, Eighteen thousand. Ah, oh, never mind. Hey man, we need this done to our website. How much is it going to cost? Nine thousand. Ah, oh, never mind. Don't work with those people because that's annoying. Um, you know, you spend all that time estimating. Not that it's a ton of time, but you're always like in that like hamster wheel, and that's not cool. So Katie's going to talk a little bit about keeping the clients. Um, so we don't t tend to have a lot of turnover with our support clients um, because they like us. <laughs> and a lot of that really just has to do with uh, communication. Um, so it's important to like be quick in your responses on support, even if you're not necessarily going to get to a task right that second. I think most clients want to know that you're sitting there, they've read your email, they, you know, that you know that they want something and you're going to get to it. Um, and th in the same vein, they also want to know that you're you know, checking in when you need clarification, that you're uh, managing their expectations for when this task is going to be done, what it's ultimately going to um, be, and all of that. So it's important not to just get a ticket in and start working on something and not talk to the client until it's done and be like, oh, look, here's this thing you asked for. And it turns out, oh, actually, you know, this part of it is wrong or this isn't exactly what we wanted. Or if you needed clarification um, to make sure that you get that so that when you're going in and doing these tickets that you're giving them ultimately what they wanted. And finally, of course, your clients want to know that you're competent and that you're good at your job. So it's important to know what you're doing, and when you don't know what you're doing, make sure you find out what you're doing um, and use best practices so that down the line they can look back at work that you've done and be like, yeah, like this is going to be sustainable. This isn't just a quick fix that is going to break you know, two months later and you're going to have to go in and fix again. Um. Like the two biggest complaints I get, like when 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 a when a client switches shops, is um, one is time. Like you know we're all busy. You know we have a lot of support clients, and um, you know it's even hard for me to be here right now. Um, and you know I still respond though. Um, I respond to every ticket the almost the minute it comes in. Um, that like hey man you know I'm here or. Um, you know, I can't work on this right now, when do you need this by? And that's huge because, and not just an automated response, like thank you for submitting a ticket, someone will get back to you soon. No, don't do that. Um, and another thing is too, um, the operate in the silo. Um, that's huge. Like a lot of people complain about like, they'll give someone like a marching order on a small project and they'll never hear from the agency till it's done. And they'll be like, this is not what I wanted, man. You know, what is this? And that's bad. All right, so bad clients. Bad clients do happen and they've happened to us. Um, the unrealistic demands and the erosion it causes. Um, you know, we have clients, you know, where they'll just be like, give me this now, 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 now. I don't care. We're the only client you should have. And what that happens is, you know, that the person working with that client becomes sad. And then their sadness spreads throughout the whole agency. And it becomes, you know, very hard to deal with, you know, and it's like, and then, it, you know, and we'll talk a little bit, like, you know, a little bit later about a, a client who kind of did that to us, but, you know, and what it comes down to is, I mean, no is a big word in support. You have to learn how to say no. Like, don't be afraid to say no. Um, and people will respect you more when you do that, if you're not a pushover. 
Um, and what you know, when when that happens, there's there's several routes you can you can you t you can uh, go down. And usually it's like let's have a talk. Let's talk about how we operate again, you know, because I mean people are on board and I'll show you later, but it's just like people have personalities and that's just the way they are. And you know, you usually have a talk and then from there you decide one of two things. Well, we can have another support person uh, work or we part ways. And don't be afraid to fire a client. It does happen every once in a while. Just because they give you money but they make you miserable, why, why be that way? You know, it's just not cool. All right, so now we're going to get down to the brass tacks. Actually, fun fact, I thought it was uh, tax my whole life, and then Katie corrected me, and um, it's actually tax with a K. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> All right, so actually, how we offer our support. Uh, we, have a, we have a couple different ways. Um, the main one we try to do is retainer, and we can usually offer a lower rate. Um, and the, the main thing is that that's great for a lot of our university clients and people like that. Our tech clients, eh, not so much. They're more time and materials. Um, even our nonprofits sometimes as well. But the good thing about a retainer is it offers a lower rate. The bad thing is it's use it or lose it, like the old school, like minutes plans. Um, and we're, we're not rigid on that. Sometimes we're flexible and we'll be cool. But I mean, in general, that's, that's the rule of thumb. Another term you'll see here a bunch of times is flex projects. Flex projects are not quite full projects, and they're not really like banging out support stuff. It's like under like under a over a couple hours, under 50 hours. You may call it sprint work. We call it flex projects, um, and we offer that a lot. And you'll see in our numbers. And then finally, emergency support. Um, we don't have too many clients to do that, but you know our rate is almost double if you want us to be like on call and things like that. And uh, every once in a while, we do have a client um, that does take that up usually a global client and things like that. All right, so this fun diagram is how we get clients on. And I had mentioned the whole sales process before, and um, once we get a client, you know, there's the agreement, there's a whole bunch of documents that happen, our master service agreement, and our statement of work, and all that fun stuff. Um, and we do it all through EchoSign, nothing is faxed anymore. Um, and then once we actually get that all, you know, the I's dotted and the T's crossed, we, um, we bring them, uh, you know, through our onboarding. We have certain documents um, that is in the last scene, like this is how you fill out a ticket, you know, this is our processes, this is how you do stuff. Um, and, and every agency has their own homegrown version of that. And then we introduce them to Zendesk. And Zendesk is our main support ticketing uh, software. And we usually give them onboard on that, show them how to use it. We have the documents for all that fun stuff. Um, and if you haven't used Zendesk, um, it's basically what I just said, a ticketing system. It's great. Um, we've been using it for three years now. All right, so when stuff finally happens, this is, this is usually our workflow. They'll put in a ticket through Zendesk. We have one point of contact usually. Don't let clients email you or anything like that. I mean, you can email clients to talk with them, but not for like work work because you'll just get lost. So you'll have like 82,000 emails and be like, I emailed you that one day, like I don't remember. Um, so you know, have them come through Zendesk. And usually right away is, you know, I'll identify if it's a project or not. Because I mean, we have our clients most of the time, like if it's like a big task, you know, or, or most everything, put them through Zendesk. And if it's, you know, a support ticket, we parse it out and fix it right away. Now, uh, when it comes down to like evaluating whether it's a project or not, uh, we use two tools post fact. For our flex projects, we use Trello because it's very quick and, and simple to use. Um, and then we all, for our big full projects that go to the agency side, they use Jira. Um, and every agency does their own thing. These are the tools that we've kind of matriculated over the time. I mean, we originally only used Trello uh, years ago and, and we kind of grew from there. Um, but th that's what we usually do. And, and everything this whole time goes into our CRM. And everybody uses different CRMs, uh, but usually you can have workflows and Slack too. Everything goes to Slack now and notifications of the yin yang and all that fun stuff. So, all right. So, like I mentioned, when people put in uh, a Zendesk ticket, we usually have two or three senior people who are the gatekeepers. Um, and everybody. Um, that works at Calamuna Support has an, a, a client that's assigned to them. And the way I, I set it up is that we'll have one major person on an account and one minor person so that you have a backup. Um, and in that way, the client knows you, 
and you don't have like a bunch of people, different people working on a client because it gets confusing and everybody's website's unique and it's better to have people who know the site to work on it. So usually what happens is there's a couple of us and we'll parse that ticket out, it's usually always me, but, um, and we send those out to the, our support people. We also have a support account manager and they're the type, they're the person that goes and they like shake the trees, you know, to get more work. Um, keep the clients happy, project management stuff. Uh, there's a lot of meetings that is involved in that role. We kind of matriculated that about a year ago and it's been actually doing really well. It takes a load off the developers so they don't have to have those meetings all the time with the clients and things like that so they can actually focus on their work. And then once we get a ticket, and it kind of falls back to what I was talking about before, um, you know, we look at the complexity. We'd be like, all right, man, do you need this now or when do you need this by? This looks more like a flex project. Let's put you into this space. Um, you know, or if it's like a timely issue, like, you know, usually what I, I tell our um, clients is to put like urgent in, in, the, in the ticket title. So that way I know it's important. However, they can abuse that. Like everything will become urgent. So, you know, kind of play with that delicately. Um, you know, so all the time though, no matter what is communication. Communication is key with all of this that, you know, when someone puts in a ticket, you just ask them, when do you need this by, you know? And the, a good client will know that you have other clients. Be like, I'm working on this one thing for this one client now. Um, you know, is, is it cool if I, I do this later today or tomorrow? And most of the time they'll say, okay. All right, now the biggest thing that I mentioned too is we want support clients to become agency clients on the project side, flex projects or full-fledged projects. I'm not afraid to tell a client what's wrong with their site. Like, I'll be like, oh, you know, I look at this and I'll be like, there's just so much jankiness and I don't, and that's fine, man. I mean, it, it, it is what it is, you know. And also, too, I mean, the master manipulator role, you want to kind of drop hints. Ah, oh, we had this client that, you know, did this over here with Salesforce or Marketo and it's really cool, you know. And they'll be like, Yes, I like Marketo. I should have that too, you know. And um, I mean, the main thing is always do a good job, you know. I mean, you don't, you know, we go to Walmart because we have to, you know, but I would rather go to a, like a mom and pop because they, all, they actually care. Be the mom and pop, you know. Be the people that care about their clients and do a good job for them and, you know, pay attention and, you know, some of my clients are my friends. I mean, for my 40th birthday, a client bought me an iPad. I mean, it's just like, you know, I mean, iPad Pro, yeah. So, uh, you know, but I mean, you know, I mean, because we're, we're helping them. I mean, they have business to run. I mean, a lot of the, the like some of the businesses we work, you know, they're, they're the boss too of their department or division or company, and they just want a reliable, good company that won't screw them over and, and treat them well. Another thing, like I just mentioned too, is show the other sites the fancy sauce. When we take a lot of support clients and we convert them to projects, you know, they, we'll, we'll show clients, be like, hey, this site is using all Panelizer with IPE and it's really cool and, you know, I know your content editors have a lot of trouble and you should use it. And they're like, we should use it. Here's money, you know? So, that's it. And just to show you conversions, um, 40.63% of all our flex projects come from support and a quarter of all our, our agency projects come from support. So it's, it's a fairly big, you know, by doing this, you know, we help the other side of the business. All right, so now we're gonna talk about our clients. All right, and the reason why I'm doing this is to show you what the typical clients you should go after, who you should target, you know, and the usual end results. So we have this one university They've been with us for a while now. Um, they have a small, you know, marketing team. It's just a couple of them. There's, and of course, they're university, so they have an IT team, and that's it. Um, they they usually do a support bucket of 150 hours a year, and um, they've gone through a couple big projects with, like, we just redid their entire setup. We broke it into four sub sites and an, an intranet. I mean, it was a huge project. It was a big revenue source for Calamuna, but it came out of support. And also, too, they referred us to their nonprofit wing, and they turned into a humongous client, too. So those are the, that's the type of university client you want to get, because if you do a good job for these smaller, and when I mean like medium-sized university, I'm talking like three to 5,000 students. Um, you know, their endowment isn't like billions, but hundreds of millions, because they will give you the money. They will pay attention to you, and that's what you want. 
All right, I'm going to tell you about a bad client. Um, many moons ago, we had this client out of, uh, I think it was Denver or Boulder or someplace over there. Um, and, you know, every time we did something for them, whether they signed off it or not, the CEO wanted it redone. Like, it was just like, I don't like this, redo it. And they wanted everything now, now, now. The CEO wants it now, now. You know, you have to do this for us. And, and then when, even when we got pre-approval, like, they fought us on every invoice. And that's just horrible. It's not a cool thing to deal with. And the final straw was this, and I remember it quite clearly, because um, we were making their site responsive, and we redid, like, all this stuff for them. Like, we had design and stuff. And their marketing person came in in the morning, she's like, I hate all of it, redo it. And I had spent, like, this was like the second design too. And the second time we, we had trouble with like the first time we were like, all right, we're just gonna do this. And I had spent all weekend. I worked like 60 hours redoing this whole thing over the weekend, non-billable, don't ever do that. Um, and they came in and they were like, no. And we we're like, gone, you know, you're gone. And it, was our, it was our first big lesson, like as a company, like, you know, we should have got lawyers involved and things like that, but I mean, it, it does happen. Not that it happens a lot, but it does happen, and they were a good example of that. Um, so a, a much nicer support client that we have currently and have been working with for quite a while um, is a small California-based nonprofit um, and this is a good example of like a type of support project that's a little bit smaller, so you're not necessarily going to get all of those opportunities for bigger projects. Um, but with this client, um, basically we're just communicating with one marketing person, and since they only have around 60 hours of support a year, it's super important for us to be very communicative with them and to tell them, okay, this thing that you just asked for, you know, that's actually going to take maybe, you know, two to three hours, which for them could actually chip, chip into their support hours enough that they might you know, want to rethink whether or not that's worth it for them. Um, so with this kind of smaller client, it's important to just keep them updated about uh, how these tasks are going and whether or not they want to expend the money to do these things because they don't necessarily have the money to do everything they want to do. And we want to make sure that uh, we're providing them the value that they really need. Um, so we get pre-approval for each task with this client. Um, another client we have <clears throat> is a California university who we've been working with for almost two years now. And this is an interesting case because they have a contract with us. It's one contract for the university, but we work with a variety of their departments. So we're actually in contact with a bunch of different people who don't even necessarily know each other um, and doing a lot of different kinds of stuff for each of these departments. And their sites are kind of just all spread out everywhere. Um, they have sites that are hosted on Pantheon, sites that are hosted somewhere else, sites that we as their support people only have front end access to, which can be kind of a challenge. Um, because if they ask us to do something, and it's like, well, we don't, we, we don't necessarily have the keys to do all of that. Um, but, I mean, this client is, like, we work well with them, I think. Um, we're able to adapt to kind of all of their different workflows and their different requirements and all of that. And they work with um, six-month retainers and usually around 150 hours a year. Six months, that's what I said. <laughs> um, and then this, the, this client is kind of a sad client story that ends happily because uh, before I worked at Kalamuna, we had this client and basically there was a personality conflict uh, with one of their contractors <laughs> and John, who was mean. <laughs> um, <laughs> And they just didn't really jive. Uh, there was just, you know, not really on the same level. Um, they were a pretty problematic client. I think there was even talk of we, we were thinking of ending our contract with them. Um, and this is a good example of how sometimes just giving a different support person a chance to uh, work with a client can kind of save a relationship because uh, now they're still a client with us after two years, basically. 
and we work with them on a lot of flex projects. Um, a lot of they like love us now, basically. Um, <laughs> Um, and the other thing with this client is that, um, and this is this is kind of a a theme in some of our clients where they they are on Drupal six, and as we all know, you know Drupal six, six is dearly departed <laughs> at this point. Um, but there's a lot of clients who they don't have the money uh, to to go forward with upgrading to Drupal seven or Drupal eight, and so having those Drupal six sites on support, you're basically just shoring up um, that system for them, even though, like, really, you know, we, sh we do want to eventually migrate them to Drupal 7, but a lot of clients just don't have the time or money to do that, and so that comes in with support a lot. Uh, speaking of Drupal 6, we're having a party tomorrow. If you didn't know, come by our booth. Uh, we're having a funeral march down to the Rusty Nail to put, uh, it's a Drupal 6 funeral. Come by the booth, get some tickets, fun time. Yeah. Um, uh, this is a Boston-based uh, tech company. They were kind of a startup uh type of thing, and they've been with us for a while. And uh, we inherited their site. It was, it was a brand new Drupal 7 site at the time, and it was built horribly. Um, and they just have like a creative director and a marketing person and a designer, but no devs. Um, and we've been working with them for a long time, and we've—I I think it's actually more than three redesigns now. But we have redesigned their site so many times; it's, it's like it's like every few months. But they also have a regular support contract bucket with us, um, and that's a great client to have, you know. And by using Cala Lead, you can find these clients easily. One of our favorite clients, the client who bought me the iPad. Um, <laughs> is uh, they've been with us for a couple years. They came to us originally for Drupal 6 support and um, they, their site was just horrible. And so we basically rebuilt it in Drupal 7 um, with some caveats from the old site. It wasn't even worth it to migrate and that was our first big project. And since then we have built so many things for them. Like it's like they've been a huge revenue source for us. They're a great client, uh, they're great people um, and we just signed a contract a couple weeks ago to convert their Drupal 7 site to Drupal 8. So it's going to be our first big Drupal 8 project as an organization, and we're pretty stoked about it. All right, so all this yammering on, and I'm going to show you why this support matters and why this is a cornerstone of our business. Um, this was our last six quarters of our total revenues, and support, Calicare, uh, is over a quarter. We consider flex projects to be supported, so we're, we're about 34% of the business. So if that's not a cornerstone, then, then I don't know what is. So that's it. Um, they told me to remind you there's multiple sprints tomorrow and please fill out a, a session feedback form, yada, yada, yada. But if you have any questions, that's it. Thanks. Hey. Uh, so I work at a university and we do some of this kind of thing on our own as a recharge service within central IT. Yep. And one pain point for us is that we have some customers who have developers on their team. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> we try to streamline our sort of support approach to like, you know, you're going to have a Git repository and you're going to have multiple environments and we do everything in dev and then promote it up and all that. Mm -hmm. And then they come in and do something like in between support cycles and we end up having to, you know, just commit a bunch of stuff at one time, just like catch up commit since yeah. the last time we were here. Hmm. How do you guys, uh, and it's a real mess, so how do you guys handle that with customers who maybe have their own devs on staff and are doing work in addition to what you're doing? I mean, communication is key, as you know. Um, you know, I, if that's your case, and I, th I think you need to like pull someone in from a higher up, and that's it actually happened to us, one of our clients, where they had multiple devs, it was a university, and they were just kind of doing their own thing, and we were trying to get them to like a uniform like type of deal. And what we ended up doing was we kind of went above them and been like, all right, we talk to whatever, whomever, and you come up with the process. And a lot of universities are in the same boat as you. Um, with some of the, like the California, like if you ever talk to any of the University of California people, they, they kind of had the same, you know, had the same dilemma. Um, and I mean, it all falls down to communication. I mean, you, if, if you set processes in place, whether it's like your style guide or even like dev practices, and it, you would have to make it concrete and you would need approval from people above. And that's about the best thing I can suggest for you. Okay. <laughs>
Thanks. You're welcome. Sorry if I missed this at the beginning of the talk, but um, we have, we work uh, kind of like you do where we have retainer contracts with clients. We have bigger projects. Mm -hmm. and we don't have, I don't think the, the what was it, the Flex? Uh, flex project. Yeah. yeah. Could you talk a little more about what that is, how you manage it business-wise? Yeah, there, yeah, they're, 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 they're also called sprints. It's usually like, um, you know, it's not a full-on like 100-hour project. It's more like anywhere from like five to 50 hours. That's usually our indicator. Um, smaller things like we need to integrate with Salesforce. And that usually takes about 30, 40 hours, depending on what you're doing. It's, it's things like that, a little more heavy duty, but not full on, let's redo the whole site. And that's what we constitute as a flex project. Is, is it a fixed cost? Do you really pay by the hour? It's, it's um, yeah, I mean, it's time and materials, but we give them estimates and we usually bill out our time and materials. Sometimes they do pay by retainer, they'll pay us 50 hours. Um, and of course it's advantageous as, as an agency to like do it less than that. But, you know, it doesn't always work out that way, but it's usually always time and materials with a um, with, with fixed estimate, like as an, as an upper echelon of, of what you're going to do. And one more question. I find out uh, for the support we do, it's sometimes hard to convince uh, clients to pay the full cost of, of doing Drupal updates. Mm -hmm. And not that it's hard to apply updates, but often testing or fixing features to accommodate that is, uh, can take a lot of time. It's really hard to predict. Yeah. Uh, how do you manage that? Um, I mean, as far as Drupal updates go, whether it's core, I mean, we're primarily on Pantheon as an, as an agency. Uh, so the core part's taken care of. Uh, module updates, usually um, the way we handle it, um, we try to do security updates when they come out. Uh, not all of them are like, you must do it now. Sometimes they do break sites, as we all know. Um, but usually when we're working on a project, and like usually a flex project, for instance, it's a great time to also throw in some module updates or, or fix some things in the back end and things like that. So that's how we usually, we don't, like, we don't, I mean, we kind of sell, like we'll keep your site updated, but it's, it's mostly when we do support, it's to like help them and fix things, not necessarily keep their website updated. But as, if you, once you do it once, as everybody knows, like, and things are kind of more current than you, when you update things, it's a lot easier. When you initially get that old site where, where they're like three years out of date, you would sell a package to be like, we need to get your site up to date. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, you, you actually, uh, the previous question actually had a lot of my own questions. I, I'm looking at starting something, starting very small, just saying, okay, with my existing clients, I just want a package that they, I'll apply security updates and stuff like that. I'm, I'm curious, like, what, what's the basic infrastructure you guys, like, do you, do you have, like, a Pingdom account? Like, what's sort of the basic service you offer? I mean, the basic, we try to go for 10 hours a month, and it's just basic support, like I just mentioned, like, because um, since the clients we go after are, aren't necessarily that small, um, they'll have, you know, updates that, like, um, a lot of, you know, clients will see stuff on other sites and they'll want that. And as long as it's, like, a small feature, that's usually included. Um, you know, if you want to sell them upgrades, you can. Uh, the, a lot of clients don't see the value in that, so we try to sell them something different and then inc incorporate that, and it usually works a lot better. So, I mean, five to ten hours if you're just getting started is a good, that's where we kind of started. Um, you may even try time and materials. I know as a smaller agency that that's not as great, but um, it gets you started, and then once they trust you, you can, like, get a more, like, flat level of billing across the board, so at least your accounting is better. You're welcome. Hi, um, I run a, a Drupal agency, fairly new, and looking to incorporate more support, so I really appreciate all the information that y'all shared. One thing that I am sensitive to is I just want to protect my coworkers and what is you know, expected from the client is their responsiveness and all that, and the way you, you've described, you know, you're, on, you're responding to your email every minute and that sort of thing, and then how you have sort of, most of your clients are on a more controlled support, but you do offer that higher threshold of, what seems like a 24-7 support. And I'm just wondering how that balance works out. Is that uh, something that you know, every employee, and it, you know, if the junior versus a senior person is different, I'd love to hear from Katie as well yeah. about how that all plays out and if that is extra stress sometimes on employees or if it, if it I works mean, well. Like I mentioned in the beginning, like some people can do support, some can't. I mean, I was kind of made to do this, it seemed like. Um, so, I mean, you have to find that person, um, at least for the responsiveness and things like that. I mean, like if someone needs to go heads down for every task and needs like 
a list of things to do. They're not made for support. Um, you know, uh, as far as the responsiveness, I mean, we do have like some backups in Europe. We have a guy that works in Romania and things like that, but we don't, the emergency support was mostly an example. I mean, right now I can only think of one client that we have that has that option and they're on the West Coast, so and I'm on the East Coast, so it's kind of works out, you know. Um, it's, if you don't have the infrastructure to handle it 24 seven, then, then don't sell it is the best answer. <laughs> Yeah, I would also say, like you were saying, that you just like need the right person. Like John Olet definitely is that person. And like for me as a junior dev working under him, like I don't feel that stress of needing to like respond to clients ASAP because I know that he will have my back. Like if I am out getting coffee and like a client emails and it's something urgent, like I know that he'll be there kind of as this backup person. Um, or like if it if it's an email at night, like you know, it, John is always the person to respond to that. Um, and as a junior dev, like I'm not really expected to be that sort of 24-hour person, which is really nice um, because you don't really need that extra stress as you're also building your skills and trying to learn like what is going on. <laughs> if I can quickly add, we're his two project managers, okay. and we celebrate John's ability to be that like context switching monster he is. Yeah. Like he doesn't sleep. <laughs> so he's, he's built like that. It shouldn't be a challenge for, for some developers to try to fit into because that could ruin you know, their, their drive, their passion about development. He is very passionate about that. So, so make sure that there's the right step. Thanks, y'all. It's great. Yeah. Appreciate it. Derek. Hey, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much, first of all, for what you do at Kalamuna and yeah. for being that cornerstone in our support program. Yeah. Um, I'm not one of those people who's just made for support, so <laughs> I, I thank you for what you do. Yeah. Um, you talked about, uh, so at Kalamuna, as you described, we have the agency side, the project side, and then the support plus flexi projects. And you talked about how you have some projects where you get pre-approval for every task. Mm -hmm. And being more on the agency side, the full build side, um, one of the big things we always want to push for is having a good discovery budget. Yeah. And so being able to go in there and actually help them, define, like we just responded to an RFP, mm -hmm. and they said, hey, we've done all the discovery, here's exactly what we need. Mm -hmm. Now, monkeys, we need some people to build it. Yeah. And, um, and we basically just responded and said, this is shit, we'll take your entire budget, do a discovery with it, and mm -hmm. then we can talk about building your website. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and so I, I'm curious, kind of on the support side, how you handle that when someone is just maybe throwing tasks at you yeah. um, and saying, hey, we need this, and it might not be the best idea. It might not be in their best interest. Yeah. Yep, that happens. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and that comes back to what I originally said. It's, you have to be comfortable with saying no. Yeah. Like, this is not cool. You don't need this. I mean, we have one client. He's like, I want all the things all the time. Give me all the stuff. And it's like, no, man, you can't have that. You know? And that's what it comes down to, is the ability to say no. And also, too, I mean, when people start working with us in support, I mean, initially at the door, we do a discovery in the kind of aspect of a site audit so that we can identify a lot of things that are wrong with their site so that we can let them know up front. Um, so when they ask for things, we know that it, after we've been working them for a while that we can say, no, you don't need this. Um, and and uh, pretty much most clients, with the exception of maybe one or two every once in a while, will not go around you. They'll just be like, I trust you, you know? Yeah, because it's yeah. like once you have that relationship with a client and you're saying like, you don't actually want this or this is not going to address what you need, yeah. they trust you. They're like, yeah, you've done good work with us. Like, I know that you're give, giving me the truth here, so. Yeah. Thank you. Second you're question. Um, one of the desires that I have in helping to define some processes is to help bring the support side and the agency side closer together and, mm -hmm. uh, and kind of uh, uh, making, um, you know, a unifying theory of the universe that works for both, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, so can you talk about what the differences are in your process uh, between those two and um, also what your relationship is with, like, is there, are there resentments? Are there, are there kind of like uh, things that uh, are sticking points between the, the two parts of Calvin? I mean, yeah, I mean, as you know, we work together. So, but, um, I mean, I've been referred to as a cowboy a lot, you know, um, and that's cool. But, I mean, you know, as we, the company has progressed, um, 
we do need designer helps. We do need a UX help. We do need things like that. Um, and the process may be a little bit different, but on straight support, we normally don't use those type of people. It's mostly, you know, grunt work, dev work, you know, site building, writing code. It's very quick, you know, boom, 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 out the door. Um, for the flex projects that we bring in, like a designer or a UX person or another or another dev, and when that happens too, you know, um, we we try at least on the flex projects um, when they want something that's usually more than just like, here's a wireframe, redo this for us. We try to do a small discovery. We always try, not that it actually happens, but <laughs> if a client approves it, but we try. Um, and we try to get that so that we have a defined process. With our flex projects through, you know, with our Trello board, um, you know, our, our project managers try to spell out tasks as best as possible for these other people, because I'll just go, 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 go. I'll blow through all the tasks really quick, and some people don't work that way. So it's, you know, and I won't, you know, there's no animosity there. It's a, it's just a different working style, um, and and you know, some people can jive with it, some people can't. You. You're welcome. Hey, uh, uh, my question was: It sounds like you direct all your client requests through your support desk. Is that right? For the, a majority of them, I would say, you know, probably more than eighty percent of them from the support side. Right, and then you determine. <clears throat> what kind of uh, request? If it's not a bug, yep. it automatically is considered a flex project. Or? I mean, not necessarily. Uh, you know, that's uh, that was a very rigid type of thing. But I mean, I mean, some support tickets take four or five hours to do, and we won't put necessarily put those in Trello. They'll stay in Zendesk. Um, and I mean, you can communicate. It's like a long email where you have everything in front of you. Same with Jira too. Um, and that, like, you know, some. I mean, not everything is going to be instant. So, I mean. Of some things go to Trello when they when they become that that sprint work that flex project where it's going to take 20 hours. We don't want 20 hours worth of thing on a long chain email because then you lose focus, especially when there's multiple things going on. But if it's one thing like this is broken, oh man, what'd you do? You know, that's usually my response. And then you know it's going to take me three hours to fix this. And um, you know that that all stays within Zendesk. Do, do you have the same rate for clients? Depending on whether it's a project or if you have, do you have like a discount for long time, long support um, packages? Or? Our rate is pretty much the same across the board. Um, like I said, retainer is a little bit cheaper. Emergency support, um, and we just raised our rates, so we're trying to get clients in that. And so, it, but it's about the same. So, sort of on the same lines, a question about um, resourcing and sort of two parts. One, do the engineers who are working in support do they only work support? Can they also work flex projects? And can they also work bigger projects? Yeah. And if they can, how do you manage that so that they're not kind of context switching? Uh, we call it thrashing at my place because yeah. somebody was supposed to be working on a project and then something bright and shiny pops up in their support queue and they go, you know, take care of that real quick because they know they can do it in an hour. Yeah. And then they've lost all the you know, momentum on their project they're supposed to be working on. Yeah, that's a big context for us as well. I mean, that, that problem. Um, like I do, I get, I get pulled into projects because I am a senior dev um, and, you know, that works okay for me. But, um, you know, it, that falls into our resource planning so that we have multiple people. We have like a, like a very generalized like time allotment for our support and then we have extra time for flex projects. Like support mostly handles the flex projects and that's kind of like on our plate. Like every once in a while, like I just mentioned, we need a designer or a UX guy to come in and help us. But um, usually most of the flex projects are dev work. And then the agency side, it does happen. Like we do need the muscle, like we brought in too much business or this is a big project and we need all hands on deck. And we, we kind of adjust you know, our resources needs for that. I mean, there's no real easy answer to that. I mean, we kind of do, a majority of our work is in the support, but we do get called on deck to other places. Yeah. Is, I, I don't mean this in a, a pejorative way, but is support kind of seen as the farm team to the agency <laughs> side? Yeah, it's kind of like the Apple II versus Mac, you know? <laughs> but um, uh, no, I mean, the farm team maybe. Uh, I, I'm not, I, I don't see myself as a farm team. I see myself as the major, so. I but. mean, it's more like, like John has been saying, like it's more what you're geared towards doing, and it's, they're just different. Um, as how I feel about it anyway. Like, I like working support. I like 
those quick tasks that you can just bang out. Um, I mean, the difference between the agency side is we're working on multiple architectures, on multiple sites, of multiple different things. Where, you know, on the agency side, and everybody's good at what they do, is like you have that one singular thing that you're working on, where we have to switch context constantly, like throughout the day. So in your hiring process, does, is, there, is there some process of kind of evaluating whether to steer people more in one direction or the other? I mean, we have like, you know, code review process when we hire developers and other things um, like that. I mean, it's trial by fire. Like, you know, we, <laughs> we, we bring people in and if you can do it, you can. If you, if you don't, then either you let go or you go work for, you know, the agency side. I mean, there, I mean, our turnover as a company isn't really high as far as personnel goes, but I mean, We've adjusted, like we've had people that tried support and it just didn't work out, you know, and so they, they went to the agency side, um, and that's fine, and vice versa, you know. So it's mostly like what you're good at, and because no one really knows until you're actually doing it what it's like, so, you know. I kind of fell into this too. I mean, I was, I was originally hired as a sales guy to do some dev stuff, and then it just kind of took off from there, so. I'm a support guy too, so I think you guys are doing the Lord's work. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, this isn't a question, it's more a, a response to the previous question actually. As an engineer who does a mix of project work and support work, one of the things that's really fun or cool about the support side of it mm -hmm. is that you're working with, you know, over months and years with the same client, it really yeah. gives you a chance to get feedback yeah. from the client, from the end user, that goes right back into the site to, to improve it. Mm -hmm. And that additional polish, you don't always get an opportunity to do on the, the agency kind of projects where it's, you know, you build it, you send it out there, you may not know if a single person ever uses the site sometimes. So yeah. uh, it, it's one of the really nice things about working at a place that does offer support as part of the package. Yeah, yeah. totally. I'm going for a second round here, so I'm just looking <laughs> around and making sure I'm not. Uh, Two-parter, very quick. Uh, you, you shared a lot of data about you know where sales and all that and where your revenue is coming in, so I'm wondering how you all track that, and I just wanted a little clarity on one of the first graphs which showed like referrals versus word of mouth versus Cali lead, mm -hmm. and how you differentiate what referral versus word of mouth, or yeah, speak to that a little bit. I mean, I took this all. I mean, we have an accounting firm that handles all our our actual. Uh, they're called Summit. Um, a lot of agencies here use it, um, uh, but we use Harvest as a time tracker for everything. And so I have admin access. So I literally went through six quarters of data manually to make all that stuff. Um, and so that's how at least the, the time stuff. Um, I mean. I know all the clients of Calamuna. Um, there's a lot of them, but and I sat down with another one of the partners, and we went through, and we also in our CRM there's a thing of where the, where the source was from, and when we do our Cal Elite stuff, because um, there's a lot of importing of CSVs uh, from Salesforce and other things that like it gets imported that way, um, and it automatically marks the source as Cal Elite, and then if someone comes in through our website or or like word of mouth or um, you know, we, that, that's kind of a loose category. But since like we do things like out, like project-y type space, so people kind of know us that they'll give us work like because of Calibox or, or things like that. Um, so that's more word of mouth. Where straight up referral is, you know, this person referred me to you, we'll mark them as referral. I mean, they're, they're subjective terms, at least when it comes to that, but it's, it's you know. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. You try. If John Ouellette and Katie Poole are the farm team, then Derek Dreps and Rob Luch are like little league. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, Thanks, I think that's it. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> what? Oh, Katie Poole, look. Look, Katie. Katie, look. I don't know what, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Chuck was gesturing wildly.